Welcome to the Down South Hunting Podcast. This is your host, Mike Higman, and you are listening to part three, our third and final installment of our scent control series with John Eberhardt and Dan Infault. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to go back and listen to parts one and two and meet me back here. Right now, I'm sitting in a dark room with no power, running on batteries. This is day five, I believe. But I'm not going to let a little Hurricane Irma Cat 5 storm stop this scent control series from getting out to you. I hope you're enjoying these interviews as much as Adam and I enjoyed doing them. We're going to jump in right where we promised and find out when the last time John was winded by a deer. And you can tell by my response, he caught me a little bit off guard and I was a little bit tongue-tied. How often do you get winded when you're hunting? Ever? When was the last Never. the last time you were winded? Seventeen years ago. Wow. Okay. Man, that's I. I they're not probably not many hunters that would say that. Uh, I've been ticked. Yep. I've been ticked in a tree, mm-hmm. but not winded. Hey, obviously, I can't tell if, if something winds me downwind and and turns around and leaves. Yeah, I obviously wouldn't know it. Right. But back in the day. When I was getting winded, you know, I was getting winded by does, and does have a habit of, you know, snorting and blowing and stomping their foot. They let you know. You know, typically a mature buck doesn't let you know if he wins you. He'll just usually turn around and leave. But I've never been noticeably winded in 17 years. I mean, I used to be noticeably, I used to notice when I got winded all the time prior to that. For a new hunter just getting into hunting, if they're on a tight budget, what priority would you put on on getting a scent lock suit? I guess the first thing that they need to get is a weapon. Um, would you maybe say it, it's more important to get the scent lock suit than spend extra on your tree stand? I know you actually use a saddle, which the sa- okay. some of those could be pretty expensive. But uh, where would you put that as far as a priority goes if somebody's just brand new to it? Well, you obviously have to have something to hunt from and something to hunt with. So obviously you need a bow and a tree stand before you could do anything okay. or some sort of a ground line. But that I would put the scent lock suit is definitely next. Okay. And obviously a pair of rubber boots you can, you know, if you don't Gotta get have a high-end boots. pair, you rubber, can get pretty cheap rubber, rubber boots. Yeah. And, well, I think if I were starting out, rubber boots always have a strong odor. So yeah. I would probably start out with a pair of neoprene boots. They have a little less odor. Okay. And yeah, I've, but you yeah, rubber or neoprene boots is an absolute must. If you wore a complete scent lock suit and head cover, drop down face mask, clean backpack, and everything, and you wore leather or cordura boots, you've just blown everything. Every day, everything you did is worthless. Okay. Because those leather and cordura boots breathe; they're permeable, so they breathe, and you're going to have foot odor coming out on the ground every time you take a step. This is maybe a little bit of an unusual question, but. A used scent lock suit, I mean, typically, if if it looks like in good shape, do you think it typically would be, you know, still have the ability to be um, re-energized where, where it'd still provide benefit? Visual of a scent lock suit has no, no relevance on whether it can be regenerated or not. It's how old it is and how it was taken care of. Is there any way you, you know, can tell? My wife has clothes that are 30 years old that she had in high school. And they look like they're brand new. When we got married, she had all these games that she had when she was a kid. My kids trashed them out in like six months. So, (laughs) you know, certain people take a lot better care of something. So the visual of something doesn't really have anything to do with how how long or how hard it's been used. Okay. Okay. Um, and, And there's no way of testing it. There's absolutely, you know, as a suit ages, there's no way of testing it. The only way to test it is if if you get to the point where you start having deer stick their nose up in the air and testing the wind like they're trying yeah. to smell, like they 
they may be starting to smell you. And then when that happens, then I put them into my scouting, then they become scouting suits. So, so say if you're a new hunter, save up and buy, buy a new suit. Yeah. And when I say suit, I'm talking about head cover with the drop down face mask. That's, that's just as important as the jacket or the pants. In okay. fact, it's more important than either one of the jacket or the pants because there's more odor coming out of your head than there is out of your upper body or your lower body. So it's got to be a head cover with a drop-down face mask, gloves, jacket, pants, rubber boots, and a clean backpack. If you're going to wear a lot of hunters don't use backs. How many so, seasons but, can you get out of it, John? Uh, with average use, you can get about, they say, Sunlock says you can get about eight years out of a suit with average use. That would be a weekend warrior three, three months a year. Um, I've got multiple suits and I, you know, I use them according to what patterns they are. And obviously, you know, what time of year it is as far as how warm they are and stuff like that. And I have some that are windproof and some that are real lightweight. So, um, I, I'll probably get 15 years out of a suit because I'm, I'm switching suits a lot mm -hmm. but a bit if a person only owned one suit they say with average use and proper care proper care is a big part of that uh it'll last about eight years so uh, with your whole scent control regimen what would you say the annual cost is you know i guess overall i'm i'm just asking for an estimate how much it would cost to, to go through the measures that you do well, if you average it out, and if a hunter bought a suit every eight years, a suit's going to be uh, usually jacket and pants are about 150 per pop, so you got 300 there, and then a head covers 40, gloves are probably 30, so you got two, three, 370. Um, you're going to have to buy boots no matter what. So if you have, let's say you have $400 wrapped up into a, a full suit, um, and it's eight years, you're looking at 50 bucks a year. And you don't you, you don't need sprays or anything. You don't spray you don't spray stuff over top of your suit. You put it on. It's clean. You don't have to spray anything over it. The only thing you spray is maybe the band on your release aid or or your bow grip. Okay. Yeah, because you do spray some of your and then you wash your backpack and no scent soap and that kind of stuff as well, right? Well, my backpack is actually an activated carbon line backpack, so I just reactivate it with my cell lock. But, yeah, okay. normal backpacks, yeah, they have to be washed in non-scent detergent and then dried and put in an airtight, can, you know, load it up. I, I suggest you load them with your gloves, activated carbon gloves on, and then put it in an airtight containers. Okay. Airtight container. I know a lot of the scent control talk revolves around skin rafts. Can you talk a little bit about skin rafts and, and how scent lock captures that? Oh, well, yeah, but they're all covered up when right. you're in a, when you're in a scent lock suit, the only thing, the only skin cells that might come off and fall off your body are going to be around your eyes. Cause basically the, the drop down face mask is covering, it covers your nose, your mouth, your ears, um, drops down into your neck area. You basically tuck it into the top of your jacket. So, so okay. there's really the only skin cells that could fall off would be around your eyes. Now, when I, I will say this, when I get ready to take a shot, I still shoot fingers. I don't shoot a release. When I get ready to take a shot, I reach up with my right hand and I pull the face mask down under my chin so that it doesn't impede my anchor point or my release. So I do pull, I do pull the face mask down when I am taking an actual shot. Yeah. Which is, you know, I'm, I'm assuming once you get to that point, the, uh, the bus not going to have time to win you and make any kind yeah. of meaningful decision. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's a little bit late for the deer at that yeah. point. <laughs> Dan, I want to touch on one thing in particular that I think John will probably bring up, and that's the Rutger study. Because looking over the Rutger study, it it really does indicate that. And and by the way, I, I don't have an opinion on one way or the other on this, but I want to read this one line on it. It says, the permeation study test results indicate the scent lock containing garments are highly effective at blocking the transmission of surrogate body odor. It goes on to say that scent lock containing garments were able to block 96 to 99 percent of the odor compounds, while non-scent lock con uh, containing garments only blocked 5 to 55 percent of the compounds. And I know you've kind of touched on this already in some of the other uh, studies that have been done um, and tests, but what do you think about this particular one? Uh, I don't know what to say. I don't, I'm not familiar with it. 
that Rutgers study is the one that they commissioned while they were going through court. Uh, and they had to prove that, uh, and, and I don't know if you want to mm. talk about that at all, but they had to prove that their product was effective in order to uh, continue well, making some you, of their claims, well, I guess. What I understand, uh, and I did, I did look at that a little bit when it, uh, when it first went on. And from what I understand is they didn't prove that their product's effective. They proved that their product um, reduces scent. And I'm not denying that one bit. Activated charcoal reduces scent. Does it reduce it to the, to the point where a deer can't smell you? That's a whole different thing. Mm-hmm. John, I was just going to ask if there are any other technologies that you've tried or tested that would even come close to activated carbon. Uh, no. The, probably the next best one would have been scent blocker. Trinity was about 26%. And when I say 26%, scent lock got sued. This one's really interesting. Scentlock got sued quite a few years ago, probably 10 years ago, by four guys in Minnesota because they were claiming it didn't work as, as advertised. So Scentlock lost the original lawsuit at the state level or the local level, and then they appealed it, and it ended up in a United States, United States District Court. And the United States District Court had Scentlock send garments to Rutgers University. Rutgers University has a science lab, and they have scientists there, and that's all they do. They are strictly scientists that deal with activated carbon technology. So they tested it, and these are the, these are the, this is a direct quote from the United States District Court's dismissal ruling. This is a direct two-sentence quote. Expert scientific testing found that using highly elevated odor concentrations that were likely 10,000-fold greater than a human body could produce in a course of 24 hours, Scentlock carbon-lined clothing blocked or absorbed 96 to 99-plus percent of odor compounds and essentially 100 percent of surrogate body odor compounds. Expert testing also found that after drying or washing and drying, scentlock carbon fabrics continued to be highly effective at blocking odor permeation. So using 10,000 times more than a human body could produce in a course of 24 hours, it absorbed 96 to 99 plus percent. That's fact. That is not made up. That came right from the United States District Court's dismissal ruling. Do you have a link so, to that anywhere where the, you know, the average hunter can, can uh, go look at that? That might be or? on some like some lock site. I I actually have the the very ruling that I could send it to you. Okay, yeah, well, and or even if it's a link, we'll put it in the show notes. Um, I I don't really have anything in a link. No, Are you talking I about that? Prob- you know what? Study? I could probably get it from Suntlock. I could call them and get it. I'm sure I could because okay. they're pretty proud of that. Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I so, actually so, have it, Mike. Okay. All right, cool. Well, we'll we'll either put a link to it or actually put the actual thing right in the show notes. Um, I think there's some people that'd be interested to read the actual ruling for themselves. Yeah, and so what's interesting is Sunlock then started using Rutgers University as their test all place. So so they sent blocker suits and they sent uh, Under Armour suits to Rutgers to test, and, and blockers was 26% as effective as Sunlock, which which is still huge. I mean, the absorptive ca- capacity, even at 26%, is huge. And that was with the carbon suit, or tested. that was their Trinity? That was their Trinity. Okay. Their Trinity, yeah, with the with their carbon suit, you know, while they were licensed from Sunlock, it was the same as Sunlock. But then when they switched to Trinity, which is a man-made absorbent, um, it was it was 26%. And so, I mean, they did some research, and they found something really decent. And, and even zeolite, zeolite, which Under Armour uses, was 5%. And even at 5%, that's pretty strong. And maybe you I can... mean, it's not 100% or 99%, but it was 5% as absorptive as Suntlock, and Trinity was 26%. As activated carbon, I should say. Maybe you can clear this up for me. My... My understanding is Scent Blocker went bankrupt, and now Scent Lock has purchased Scent Blocker. Are you familiar with that situation? I am. I got copied on that. Scent Lock did purchase Scent Blocker, and uh, 
I did talk to Nick Andrews at Scentlock. They don't know exactly where they're going to go with it, but, but uh, it's a very viable brand. So, you know, it's something they're definitely going to keep going for okay. sure. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know what they're going to use in it. They're not, they, Nick told me they probably would not use the same exact thing they're using in their Scentlock suits. It would probably be something else. Okay. But it would still be something that's extremely absorptive because because now Scentlock's using some other stuff too. They actually added some treated carbon and some uh, zeolite to their activated carbon a couple years ago. They didn't change the amount of activated carbon they used, but they added thirty percent more in treated carbon, which is basically activated carbon that goes through another process, and then they or they added some zeolite because zeolite which is what Under Armour uses exclusively, zeolite has some odor absorption uh, capabilities that activated carbon doesn't because its pore structures are a little bit different sized. So zeolite is inferior for most body odors, but it does absorb some better than activated carbon, a small amount, and Sotlock wants to be as close to perfect as they can be. You know, I think the thing that really offended people before that lawsuit was the whole forget the wind thing, that you, you could just forget the wind, um, because people would buy it and believe that. Uh, there's a certain percentage of people that believe the advertisements and, and, and such. I mean, I got a guy at work who uh, who um, was just like uh, all gung-ho about scent control because he heard some s- speech on it or something, and he was going to get scent control because he was getting busted a lot. Um, cause where he hunted, there was only like six trees and the deer would always smell them when they'd come out. So he went and bought scent control and he still got busted. So, uh, me and a couple of the other guys were making fun of him and joking about him and stuff. And he's getting pissed, you know? So he calls scent lock all mad and, uh, they tell him, well, you're not doing it right. You got to do this, this, and, and that. So he does that and they, they still bust him. So he calls them back and they're like, well, no, you gotta do it. He goes, well, you didn't tell me that last time. And after about the third time, they just didn't want to talk to him anymore. <laughs> I, you know, but he did everything they said, and he was getting busted. You, you know, <laughs> and that's with brand new stuff. Deer can smell you through it. If, if your air is going through it, they can smell you through it. I don't care if it takes 96% out. I don't care if it takes 99.9% out. There's some getting through. It's not, to, it's not stopping 100% of the scent from getting through. John, do you think for most hunters it's the thought process that goes into it that that is the barrier to going all the way with it as far as ignoring the wind is maybe they don't think about some of the small details that that you do oh with that well yes and no i think i think there's a boatload i think the majority of hunters that bought scent lock suits or sun blocker suits obviously they bought them so that they wouldn't get winded that's the reason that otherwise they'd be have no reason to spend that much money but it's not their fault if they were never taught how to do everything proper and do everything else in conjunction with the scent lock suit again you watch the tv shows the guys that scent lock pays and sponsors their shows they've got beards they've got face paint they wear logo caps so what does the consumers do? They replicate what their so-called hunting experts on TV do. And, you know, they're hunting places where they're hunting managed areas where bucks are three and a half, four and a half years old before there's ever any consequences. There's age and kill criteria. So those deer go by hunters all, you know, for two or three years with no negative consequences and, you know, before they reach the uh, kill criteria. So they have a lot more tolerance of human interaction and human odor. So, you know, hunters that hunting pressured areas, they don't have that luxury, yet they're still replicating what they're seeing on TV, which is totally wrong. So, you know, I'm not blaming the hunters. They just don't know any better. I guess that's the best way of putting it, because I think most hunters that buy that stuff yeah, they want to learn how to do it right, but they just don't know how to do it right because they're replicating what they see on TV and in videos. Yeah, and you did mention earlier that there are benefits to it, even if you don't, you know, take it to the, you know, complete control. Uh, 
that it is going to help some as far as, you know, maybe you don't have, you don't you can't ignore the wind, but it's still going to help your entry and exit and that type of stuff as well, right? Well, of course, you know, 50% of something is better than nothing. You know, I'd rather drive a car with four tires with 10, 10 pounds of pressure than walk. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's a good way of putting it, you know. Uh, so the truck, the car is not going to drive as well as it would at full 32 pounds of pressure on each tire, but it's still going to drive and it's going to get me there a lot faster than walking. So yeah, 50% is better than nothing. And also, also it depends on where you hunt. You know, a lot of hunt people that hunt in suburbia or in rural areas close to closer to big cities or in rural areas where there's 10 or 20 houses in a section, you know, there's always residual human odor floating around, always, 100% of the time. So, you know, depending on where you're hunting in a suburban area, deer are going to tolerate a pretty high level of human odor before they would spook. Um, you know, the, the levels of human odor kind of dictate to the deer how close that person is and whether that thing, person is a threat or not. Now, you get up into the upper peninsula in Michigan or northern Wisconsin where you know, hardly anybody hunts and it's all timber and stuff, you know, it's going to take just a minute trace amount of human odor to spook a mature deer because they don't smell human odor that much and they know it's dangerous. So, you know, there's different levels of acceptability and tolerable levels depending on where you hunt, you know, out even in farming areas, there's, there's certain trace amounts of human odor in the, in the air. So yeah, if you can knock 50 or 60% of your odor down, uh, yeah, you're going to be able to get away with a little bit more than none at all. Dan, you touched on this a little bit with Andre. I've heard people that are proponents of scent control, you know, look at you and look at your success and, and think, you know, that's perfect for what you do because you're hunting one area and moving on and, and you actually want the deer to not use that area because you got a bunch of different spots lined up. But they say maybe somebody that's hunting the same tract of land uh, over and over again, they want to use scent control so that they're not, you know, sending all the deer to the neighbor's properties. And you touched on Andre. I believe he hunts a lot of his own private land and and doesn't use scent control. But what do you think about those ideas? Well, uh, if you're hunting your same land over and over and over and over again, um, using scent control, thinking you're getting away with something you're not. If you hunted less and glassed more and sat back and moved in, it, I would hunt it, uh, you know, and I got a farm that's 70 acres over here that's private, that uh, me and the landowner are good friends. We're the only ones that hunt it, and he hunts the way I hunt. We hunt it about three times a year, and we have good hunting because of that. When I first started hunting there, he wanted to hunt there all the time. We never saw crap, so I just quit hunting there, and <laughs> then he was asking me, you know, about about why I wasn't hunting her, and I was explaining it to him. And I was never uh, dishonest, but I told him all the time why we're not seeing deer. And when he finally gave it a shot, all of a sudden we start killing stuff over there mm-hmm. because you have to back off. Um, if, if you put pressure on your land, deer are going to know you're there. Scent control or not, they're going to know you're there. That's all there is to it. You're not going to eliminate all your scent. And reducing it isn't going to make them think you were there a week ago. They can smell how old that is. They can smell how far away you are. Um, you know, they'll say, people will say, well, you know, I want that deer to think I'm further away. Well, if I can reduce my scent and make deer think I'm further away, I'll sneak up and shoot them in their beds. Again, we'll go back to that same thing. Because if he thinks I'm a mile away, I can walk right up to him and shoot him in his bed. You're going to have no concern. Because you can't tell me they can't smell deer from their, or people from their bed. No matter where they're bedding, they smell people. At least in any suburban area in the United States, they do. I mean, uh, uh, you look at bear studies and, and they watch bears come out of their dens and turn on a dime and go in a straight line with their GPS collar to a roadkill from, for 10 miles. They can smell a roadkill from 10 miles. So I'm telling you, a deer can smell people all the time when he's in his bed. He has to be able to judge distance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you look at deer in suburban areas, obviously they're, they're within hundreds of yards of people all, all the time, and they, they obviously aren't spooking all the time. Uh, but I think if you talk to guys that hunt them, you can't get right up next to them without them spooking. Speaking of suburban areas, there's a spot over here that I, I was hunting a few years ago that uh, opened up that's uh, a little strip of uh, woods 
that's right between the uh, subdivisions that uh, was bow only and opened up. And I wanted to get in there and hunt this one buck I was seeing over there. So I got in there and uh, was watching. And uh, where the most action was was right up against this yard. And the yard had a bunch of kids' toys in it, and there's kids playing in this yard all the time. And these deer would walk right past those kids in the yard downwind, never look at them, never nothing. Obviously, they can smell them. They'd never have any reaction. They'd walk right by them 20 yards away, but the kids can't see them because of the brush. I could see them inside the woods. You know how the edge of the woods is thick. Mm -hmm. So what was interesting is you watch one of these kids run in the woods to get a ball to get into the woods and then run back out and watch deer downwind get alert. And, uh, and know something's going on over there, even though they can't see it and the noise ain't much difference. The kid went 10 yards too much further into the woods, and those deer knew it. And then, you, you know, they could smell that that kid is in the woods, the difference. Um, when he'd go over there, walk over and get his ball or whatever, or walk into the woods, all the deer would get alert, even though they can't see him. I can see him because I'm in an elevated position. And you watch all those deer get alert, even though they can't hear him. They could smell him closer. What are maybe some of the upsides if if you want to you know basically do your method, take no scent control, and just play the wind? Well, it, you won't get the, uh, into the lull of believing you're getting away with something. If you know they can smell you, you set up correctly, you hunt correctly. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, that's the biggest benefit. Other, otherwise, uh, deer not being able to smell you would definitely be a, a much bigger benefit. Uh, one thing though. Um, I'm sure you're going to get into it with John about his, um, what he does for scent control. Sure. And, uh, now I haven't done it, but I know people who have, and I would say it's a benefit not having to watch my diet for the whole year of what I eat. Um, I would say it's a benefit of not losing, uh, you not having to run home, take a shower, get cleaned up, um, go someplace to hunt, get outside of a vehicle, completely undress, completely dress, um, spray myself down, go through this routine. It probably takes about an hour, hour and a half out of my day. If I got a shower and, and go home first and clean and all that stuff. Uh, I think you'd be, a um, uh, a heck of a lot better off or have a heavier wall full of bucks. If you spent that uh, hour, every time you hunt that hour more hunting, rather than uh, dressing and undressing in a field. And, you know, I think he even takes it to the extreme of shaving his body because uh, he believes that the hair holds scent. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, I can't imagine. That would take all the fun out of hunting for me. So Mm -hmm. that's my (laughs) (laughs) benefit-wise. Can you think of any times there you might have missed an opportunity at a particular buck you were targeting just because you couldn't get the wind right to hunt your location where... You know, maybe if you weren't weren't so worried about the wind, you would have had a better shot at him. No, oh, absolutely. There's there's plenty of times where I waited for the right wind and it never came. Uh, there's yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, there's plenty of times when uh, I pushed the envelope and got the deer anyways, hunting upwind of them because it was the only shot I had, and the deer didn't smell me. There's plenty of times when he did. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, absolutely. And I guess if you know you're never going to get the right win, then I guess you go ahead and try to do it anyway. Just, what you know, what's the point in not doing it? Well, I, I'm a big component, too, of uh, never giving them a free spot. You, you don't want to give them a spot where they can just live uh, and not pay the toll. Um, I want to make sure that I got the pressure on him in each spot so that he just doesn't stay there and I can't hunt him in the uh, rest of his bedding areas. You know what I mean? So if you've got a spot where you look at, man, there's no perfect win for this spot, you're going to go ahead and give it your best shot, knowing it's probably not going to work just to get him out of there. If, if it's a buck worth really going after. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. How about, how about using other hunters and, and their uh, scent to kind of predict where you might want to hunt? How, how do you use that to your advantage? Well, I kind of uh, just stay away from any place other hunters go. I think I, I use the 10% rule usually on public land. Uh, first of all, the land has to, to hold bucks that I'm after. And then I look at it and I say, okay, let's mark off 90% of this map. Where do hunters go? Where, where is flooded with hunting? Whatever's left, 
where people just ignore is the spots where I check out, and that's where I find this big box. Um, because they stay away from any place where they smell humans. Mature bucks don't mix with uh, human scent. Um, so those overlooked spots are where nobody goes is usually where I kill those big bucks. When when you're going out for a hunt, uh, how often are you changing what tree you're going to hunt on the fly based on wind direction versus, you know, maybe you scouted in the spring and, and you know of a particular area you wanted to hunt are you usually know ahead of time what specific tree you're going to go to, or is it kind of like, let me get in the area and, and see what feels right? Like a farm dog. There's probably a 50% chance I'll hit the tree I'm intending on going to. <laughs> 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 I get out there, I might see sign and I'm off over here, over there and, uh, and you know, but, uh, or wind, you get out there, especially hill country, you get in hill country and what it's doing at your truck, it's not going to be doing up on that hill. It's going to be a little different everywhere you're at because it's following those contours and it's just crazy in hill country. You just about got to go to your spot, and check the wind uh, to know. So is that something over the years where maybe you've developed being able to get closer to bedding areas and get busted less? I mean, is that something, would you say you get better at that every year? Well, yeah, it's an ongoing thing. I'm always, I'm always getting better. Yeah. There's always things I'm coming up with um, and learning I mean, it's been in uh, uh, recent years, I mean, the last five, six years that I started really picking up on, like, water thermals, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I'm always learning. And as long as you're observing and open-minded, you'll continue to learn. Um, the problem we have with hunters uh, is a lot of them, as soon as they start getting a little better than their friends, they get cocky. <laughs> and they start believing they know everything. And uh, that's when you shut down as a hunter and stop learning. You got to realize you can you can always learn things, um, and there's in a lifetime you'll never learn everything about hunting. And sometimes it's those little things you pick up that make you a better hunter. Um, there isn't some giant big secret like everybody thinks. I mean, that's the big thing I hear all the time. What's your secret? You know, well, how do you kill these deer? Well, hey, you, you ask me how I kill the deer. You want me to write you a book? <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? It's it's a million little things. And everything that ups your odds a half a percent is what comes up with this, you're doing better than everybody else. It's to all the little things combined. John, what, what would you say are the upsides and the downsides of using a rigid scent el elimination routine? Well, the upsides, you're going to get far more, far, far, far more opportunities. 50% of the deer, because I paid zero attention to wind, 50% of the deer are the come in to me or downwind because I pay no attention to wind directions. So, you know, I'm not, I don't go sit in this spot and say, oh, the wind's perfect for this spot. You know, none of the deer are going to come from downwind. I don't do that. So, you know, half the deer I see are downwind of me. And what was the other part? That's, that's right. obviously the perk of a good scent control regimen. The negative, the there is no negative. <laughs> How about the, t the time investment on that? Would you consider that a negative at all or? No. No, one, no, anytime you get a scent control regimen down, I, it just becomes routine. It's, it's habit. The hardest part is the first year, maybe, you know, remembering to do everything right. But I, I hunt out of a minivan, a soccer mom minivan. You know, I don't let my ego get in the way and have to drive a truck. Um, so I take all the seats out of my minivan the day I buy it, and it's like a little mini hotel room in the back. You know, I've got my tote with my scent lock suits in it. It's an airtight tote. I got an airtight tote that my backpack's in, and then that's pristine, clean all the time. I've got a tote with all my layering garments, then they're washed in non-scent detergent and put in the tote, and that's airtight as well. And then I've got my waterproof Rivers West garments, and those are also washed in non-scent detergent and put in an airtight container. Now, as soon as I wear, if, if I were to wear a layer garment out of, you know, out of one of my totes, um, that would not go back in the tote once I wore it once. I may wear it again. And if I think I'm going to wear it again, I'll put it in a plastic bag and seal it. But it won't go back in the tote to contaminate anything that's in the tote. Same with my waterproof. You know, if I'm, if I've got a, if it's raining out, I'll wear a Rivers West oftentimes as my exterior because Scent Lake doesn't make any waterproof stuff that I care for. I don't like any of their waterproof clothing. So I'll wear a Rivers West as my exterior, and it's washed in non-scent detergent. So as soon as I wear it one time, it, it 
doesn't go back in the container. It gets washed in nonsense detergent, dried, then goes back in that airtight container. So I don't let anything contaminate something else, you know, in, in one of my airtight containers. Now on my scent lock suits, once I wear my scent lock suit, I put it on in the field outside of my vehicle. When I get back from hunting, it goes, comes off, gets put back in its uh, carbon bag and then back in the airtight tote. I'll put that back in a tote. But any of the other stuff does not go back in their respective totes. They go in a plastic bag, and I may use it again. And if I don't, I'll wash it before I put it back in. And it's not it's not a hard process once you get used to it. It's very simple. Okay, and and that obviously you go in deep detail into your in your in your books on exactly how you do that uh, in setting up the system. So um, yeah, in my if, I'd say in my last book I do bow hunting okay. whitetails the Eberhart way. Is definitely it has a it has a chapter on scent control and it has a chapter on hunting standing corn, but the scent control chapter in that one's by far the best because that was 2010. My previous two books were 2003 and 2005, so the 2010 book definitely has the most current scent control chapter. Okay, your strategies and and ways you handle these things that have evolved over time, right? It's not like you decided to do this 10 years or 15 years ago and have done it exactly the same way. You've kind of refined and and made some of the things you do better. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I I would say in the last seventeen years, a lot of a lot of things have. I don't know. My scent control regimen is pretty much the same. I really haven't changed a lot in that. I mean, the scent, the scent lock clothing has gotten better. You know, they've they've got more features. They fit better. They're old clothes didn't fit very well but um i really haven't changed anything other than the airtight containers now are much much better back back probably 10 years ago i used to buy the rubber made or the sterilite totes that you can buy for like seven dollars in any general mass merchant store and but they're not airtight so i would put my clothing in steel sacks plastic bags and seal them and then i'd put them in the the rubber made totes just so that the bags wouldn't get ripped. So, you know, I didn't have the nice airtight containers that I have now, but yeah. the, the, uh, my, my procedure really hasn't changed a lot, but the last book spells it out a lot better. You know, I go into detail on every container, what's in them, you know, how I change my clothes and blah, blah, blah. When you say make the, the effort, how much time does it take you to get suited up and to go through this process? Uh, when I get in the back of my van, from the moment I step between my seats and get in the back of my van to the time I open my side door and walk out is 10 minutes, probably. That's not Five bad. to 10 minutes. Depending on how cold it is, you know, if it's really cold and I've got to put on multiple layers and, you know, pack some more undergarments in my backpack, it takes a little, you know, it might take 10 minutes, but typically it's five to 10. So I think there's going to be hunters probably all over the country listening to this podcast about scent control but uh the name of the podcast is down south there's a lot of guys here in the south uh that are going to be listening to this and you know in early august it could be 90 degrees so um does your system work maybe when you're going to be sweating like crazy getting in your sand is is that could that person ignore the wind on that one, Mike, you got me a little tiny bit. <laughs> because, I'm not trying to get you here. I'm trying this. to get some answers. <laughs> no, well, I'm going to be honest, and I'm yeah. going to be very, very frank. If you know, fortunately, I'm in Michigan. I feel really sorry for people that are hunting in Florida, North Carolina, and Georgia. You know, where it's, it can be 90 degrees. I don't hear Michigan hunters say very often they feel sorry for other hunters. <laughs> so, well, I do. But I yeah, feel you sorry got it on for the hunters that have to, that have to hunt in that. That kind of heat because I I'm a I sweat really easy so you know I I also carry a, a Ziploc baggie with you know scent free wipes in it so when it's hot and I get on my stand and I get on stand and if I've been sweating my face is all sweaty obviously I will wear a t-shirt in underneath my scent lock jacket and I'll have another t-shirt in my backpack so I'll swap those out and I'll take the I'll take the stinky T-shirt that I take off, and I'll put it in a gallon Ziploc bag and seal it so there's no odor and put it in my backpack, and then I'll put on a clean one once my body cools off. 
but when my face gets all sweaty, uh, even though I'm wearing a, a hat, it's not like hat with a drop down face mask, I still have my eyes and my part of my face exposed. So I wipe it down the best I can with some scent free wipes. But one time, one time I was hunting in Southern Michigan and I, I just swept my butt off getting on stand. It was like a half mile walk and it was like 90 degrees. And, uh, and I wiped off the best I could. And I still had, I had three year and a half old bucks come in and, um, they did win me. So that, so I did lie when I said 17 yeah, years, that, nothing that, to me. Those, not a hundred percent. That okay. one time, <laughs> that one time those three bucks went at me and it was definitely 100% because I had perspired so much in my face. And even after I wiped my face down, it was so hot. I was still perspiring on my face. You know, even after I wiped down, it was just yeah. so hot. And of course, that sounds I've got, familiar. You know, clothes on. I'm sure it does. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> like about Florida. four months of my hunting season. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Really hot is it? It's it's tough. You know, like when I go out pr- on my preseason speed tours to check for my early season hunting locations. You know, I'm wearing a scent lock suit and you know i've got on the same regimen as i do when i'm hunting and uh yeah and i get really hot during those trips as well so in that situation would you suggest you know if you know you're going to be sweaty and hot like that would you suggest that hunters pay attention to the wind and keep that in mind or it's not even worth it yes you're going to get busted sometimes but there's such an advantage to ignoring the wind that you should just do the best you can and you might get busted but really ignoring the wind gives you the best chance But really ignore. Well, I know that time that I did get busted, that set a precedent for me. Mm-hmm. And now I go through extra measures if I do run into that same scenario, and which I have. And I wipe down a lot better. And I wipe. I may use four or five different wipes to wipe my my face down. And I wipe more frequently. That time I wiped off my face initially. You know, when I first got on stand. And then I continued to sweat, and I never wiped my face down again. So after that, I wiped my face down, you know, probably every half hour if I'm still perspiring. So, and I haven't been winded since. But uh, okay, so just take it. No, take it to the next level. Yeah, yeah. You okay, just take it to the next level. You just do it a little, little bit better than you did the the time before. Dan, could you give us uh, maybe a story or two where? Your tactics of, of just playing the wind worked out to your success, maybe where you knew how the wind was going to work in an area or, or something along those lines? Put me on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you got a whole bunch of stories, Dan. Yeah. Uh, just about every hunt, it's about the wind. I mean, uh, my biggest bow kill, at least uh, in my eyes, it's the biggest one, is the 400-pound slop. Uh, that deer... Um, was betting in a spot right next to a parking lot. The, the uh, common wind there blew right up into his bedding area, uh, and he exited his bedding area into the wind. He was betting in that area. It was a thick, swampy area, no matter what the wind was, but the common wind was in his face. That and, and the only real tree you could get in was a big willow tree. Um, nothing else around there was suitable to put a stand in, and it wasn't suitable to hunt off the ground I sat in the parking lot and watched him and made sure he was still in the same routine and checked on him until the wind was right. And the wind was right. I went in there, shot him the first day I hunted him. That's a prime example, and that's usually the way it goes for me. Well, Dan, I think that's a great place to to tie things up here. I just want to give you an opportunity to maybe share how people can learn some more about you. I know you've got the website, your videos, YouTube. Where can people learn more about you and, and your hunting tactics? I think if they come to the hunt and beast dot com uh, and they go to the deer forum, we have a, a sticky topic called the greatest threads. It's all about tactics. It's a great place. Uh, my YouTube videos are pretty good too. Yeah, I mean you got to go through some of them are a little goofy, but there's uh, some really good ones buried in there. Um, yeah, those spots. Uh, my my hunting videos, my DVDs are really good. Um, if anybody hasn't uh, heard of those, uh, they're all tactics. Um, how we hunt bedded bucks, basically. Yeah, um, and those I'll, are available on my website. 
I'll I'll vouch for those those videos. Even if you don't hunt the same type of terrain that you do, the concepts are ap- applicable to to any hunter. And I would say even if you're somebody who's listening that maybe doesn't agree with Dan on the scent control issue, uh, there's definitely a lot you can learn just from his other tactics. Because obviously, not doing scent control is is not his only tactic. So I would suggest anybody to check out the Honey Beast. It's a real cool community. And uh, those videos are are tremendous. Do you have any final thoughts, any advice you've got for hunters that are listening to this and either looking on for, you know, trying to come up with their own scent control strategy or how they're going to deal with scent or, or anything else? I think you got to kind of look at uh, how a deer smells and uh, think about this. I mean, a deer has 297 million olfactory receptors. A human has five. So you really can't even compare. Now you think about it, if you're out in the backyard and uh, you're like me and a skunk goes by and you want to catch it, so you run over and grab it by the tail and you get sprayed and then you're like, uh oh, the wife's going to be mad. I'm not like you, right? I can tell you that. For a lot of reasons, okay. including that one. But... Well, some listener might be. <laughs> <laughs> so you're thinking, uh oh, when I go in the house, she's going to be pissed, you know? So I better get this scent off me. So you take a dry towel and you wipe that off. You wipe off the liquid scent. I guarantee you, you removed a lot of it. You might even remove 97% of it. But when you walk in the house, I guarantee you she's going to smell it. <laughs> to, a, to a deer, we stink like a skunk. They smell hundreds of millions of times better than us. You're not wiping that off with of carbon. You're not wiping that off with of a spray. You're not stopping it. Period. Um, I guess that's my final... <laughs> John, I know you've probably got a ton of stories. Do you think maybe you could share maybe one or two more about how uh, ignoring the wind was an advantage with uh, a mature buck? Uh, yeah, God, I've got a billion of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll tell one that I, I actually told it the other day. Um, was in 2004, election day. Um, I voted up in northern Michigan where I lived, and then I drove about two and a half hours south to hunt. And I got in my tree, and this was at a primary scrape area, okay? So, and this was one of those primary scrape areas where my tree was actually on the downwind side of the scrapes. You know, that's the way I set it up because I knew this big buck was in the area, and I knew he was working this one scrape area. So I got my tree about noon. And at about two o'clock, two thirty maybe, um, this big buck came through, and he was he was coming through this it's, this primary scrape area was at an apple tree, but the apples were gone. So, but he was still working this scrape area, even though the apples were gone, because it was also in kind of a funnel transition area, funnel between two bedding areas, and he was coming down through this transition zone. And instead of coming into the scrapes, he, he started circling around. So I was in, because I was in my sling, I swung around the tree because initially I was, I was in my sling. So I had the tree between the tree was between me, my body and the scrapes. That's how I was sitting when I, when I was sitting and and set up. So he was kind of circling around the scrape. So I swung 180 degrees around the other side of the tree. And by the time I got around there, he had just went through one of my uh, shooting lanes. So I didn't get that shot. And I watched and he started to turn and he's coming around to the downwind side. So I swung back around the tree 180 degrees and he came around downwind I don't know, at about 20 yards, and then he turned, and then he walked up, and he stopped right underneath me. If I had a spit, it would have hit him in the back. He was directly underneath my tree. And he's he's sent checking those scrapes, which are about 15 yards from me. And I'm like, I'm, I won't take a straight-down shot. I just won't do that. And when he was coming in, I won't take a straight-on shot either. So he he's... He stood there for probably 30 seconds, and then he just turned around and started walking back in the exact same footsteps that he came in on. He was coming, going back around the tree. So I swung 180 degrees back around the tree. So now I'm ready for him to go through that shooting lane that I didn't get in 
that I didn't shoot him in the first time because he went through it before I got there. So I swung back around the tree, and when he got in the shooting lane that time, I came to full draw and meh, did a blat, dove blat, and he stopped, and I and I shot him. But that was one time that the, I used the wind to my advantage at that scrape area. Man, that sounds, but I sounds have, intense. I have so many deer, Mike, I <laughs> because I don't pay attention to the wind, I I honestly, literally, I don't even think about the wind, and so I I struggle remembering the ones that were where the deer was actually downwind of me when I shot him because I don't pay attention to right. it. Right, yeah. That sounds weird, but I mean, it's just a truth. <laughs> well, I'm sure you have any stories where maybe they came in on the on the trail you used to come in on? I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. Actually, that was another election day buck, 2006. It was another midday. And uh, it was a place right up by a road. It was, uh, I was hunting 20 acres, and there was two other guys that hunted the same 20 acres. And I've, I'd never met these two guys in my life. But, and I'd hunted that property for probably four years. I was just always in my tree way before they got there, and I always got out way after they left. So anyway, this was a midday deal. Again, I voted up north. 2006, it was a midterm election. And I voted, got down there, got in the tree again, probably noon, one o'clock-ish, and about, I think it was about a quarter to three, uh, this big 10 point. And I knew there was a big buck in the area, but I had had never seen him before, that other one I'd seen once. Um, he came in, and he came right down right down the lane that I was, that I came in on, because I do remember I put a tarsal on the tree and he was following that tarsal that I had drugged to the drug to the tree. In fact, I did that. I did that twice. <laughs> I did that twice, two 10 points that actually cut a tarsal drag. And these were real tarsals that I actually cut off deer that I shot. So both of these, they followed the tarsal, which obviously was on the route that I walked in on to the tree and they both of them were sniffing the tarsal at about 10 yards when I shot them. And they, they were both 10 points. One was 140 and one was 136. Wow. Wow. Well, I guess, I guess the, we're doing a scent control podcast, but on a side note, if you're in Michigan on election day, make sure you vote early and, <laughs> and get out the stand in midday. <laughs> and they were both midday kills on election day. Those, those two. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and the tarsals were, again, those were not commercial tarsals. Those were tarsals I cut off through that I shot the year before and I shrunk wrapped them. I shrink wrap them and then I cut them and I used them okay. the rut phases. Well, uh, do you have any, I want to give you a chance to talk about your workshops and videos and books, but before that, do you have any final thoughts, anything else that we didn't ask you about or cover? Nope. <laughs> all right well we, co well, we covered a lot I, we tried to do a thorough interview so so that's good to hear well okay now that being said uh why don't you start off telling us about your um your workshops and but i also want to hear about your videos and and your books as well okay well my workshops are something i just started this year so um they're two-day workshops and the first day is in field basically it's on a 37 acre piece that I've hunted since 2007, a free permission okay. property, and I'm sh kind of shocked that the owner is letting me do these because we're trashing the property out for this hunting season. Uh, but anyway, I have 14 locations prepped, and it's just a walkthrough showing entry routes, exit routes, why I set up at this height, why in this tree, is this a morning spot or an evening location, is it an early season location, a rut phase location? you know, explaining everything and every detail about every location. And and they're all different. This, this, even though it's 37 acres, it's 170 acre parcel, but there's only 37 acres of timber. And the way it's kind of, the rest is all crops. So the way it's, it's spread out is kind of unique. There's funnels on this property. There's swamps. There's a river running through it. There's some apple trees on it. There's white oaks on it. It's just got a lot of cool looks that a lot of people can relate to because it has a lot of different looks. And then the second day is at the biggest sporting goods store in Michigan, Jay's Sporting Goods, and that's basically a seminar, a full seminar day. And it'll be a lot of Q&A, and, and, and I cover scent control to the max. I will actually, I have my vehicle there. It's loaded just as it is during hunting season. I 
kind of get in and replicate, you know, how I get ready to go hunting and go through the scent control routine. And we talk about scent control for at least probably an hour and a half to two hours. Because everybody that comes, that's the key thing they want to take away from this is, is scent control for the most part. Uh, as, as far as on the seminar day, the infield day, they want to get a visual of what okay. I do. And and they're $600, and they're on my website, uh, which is www.deer-john.net. And we'll link that up in the show notes. Or, oh, okay. But All yeah, right. go ahead and share it, too, because some people won't ever go to the page, so... Yeah, there. <laughs> <laughs> the other okay, www.deer-john.net, or the other one would be www.eberhart's bow hunting. I'm sorry, eberhart's whitetail workshop.com. Okay, is the other one, and I'm also scouting properties for people. Okay, and and it's six hundred dollars for the workshop, or six hundred dollars a day for scouting. So it's pretty cheap, actually, for what else. Is you know, I, yeah, I thought about this with this deal you have worked out with this property owner. Do you ever work deals out with people where you'll trade, maybe helping them scout or, or help them out with their property some for permission? Uh, that's how I got yeah. this property. <laughs> I, I was doing a seminar, and uh, this guy came up to me afterwards, and was a farmer, lived on the property all his life, same age as me, and real soft quiet spoken guy and said you know would you be interested in scouting my property and i that's not something i did back then at the time that was 2007 but uh he was local and he he had a decent piece of property so i did and i did it for free permission and now him and i are like best friends he reads the wall street journal every day cover to cover really Mm. smart guy and and we just get along really really well if you have if you've got 100 acres of prime land in the Midwest, maybe hit John up and work something out with him. Although you might not want him hunting your <laughs> land if, if, if you want to kill any of the mature bucks on it. So maybe well, I'll tell you what, the there's money. three guys that hunt this 37 acres, and I've killed five book bucks off it, and none of the other guys. I've hunted it for nine years. They've hunted it for 20-plus years, and none of those guys have taken a book buck off it. So, <laughs> so maybe if you can't kill him and you've got a vendetta... <laughs> Then bring John out. <laughs> <laughs> I typically don't do that, though, Mike. I typically, yeah. if somebody comes and says, "Will you scout my property?" and I'll let you hunt it, and sure. I never ask. I when I'm doing seminars, I or talking to people. I I typically don't ask people on their property. I figure if they want me to hunt there, they'll ask me. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you've got some videos as well. Uh yes. I well, the videos are old. They're 2005. It's uh. It's a three DVD set. There's no kills on them. These are strictly instructional bow hunting. They're two hours each. And DVD one is on postseason scouting and location preparation. So it's strictly postseason. I think that's the most important one of the three. Postseason scouting is that big of a deal. Uh, DVD two is on preseason scouting and location preparation. And then DVD three is on in season hunting and in season scouting. Uh, and then the books are Bow Hunting Pressured Whitetails, Precision Bow Hunting, and Bow Hunting Whitetails the Eberhart Way. Okay. And I think I'm going to write another book for deer and deer hunting. They asked me to write a book on pressured whitetails about two weeks ago for next year. Great. And you just had an article come out on, on that magazine. What was it? This month, right? Oh, yeah. It's in the September issue of Deer and Deer Hunting. And I actually, in that article, I tell people... I, I think I, I think my email address is on there. I'm, I, if you want to email me, I'll send you all the pertinent information you need on scent control, proper care instructions, and all that stuff. So it's, I've, I've been getting on average about ten emails a day. Yeah, on people wanting all that uh, information on scent control. Well, and I think you're crazy for this, but if if you ever want to talk to John, he his phone number is right on his website. So um, I I know you're real helpful <laughs> to people that are. <laughs> I want to I figure actually, out how to do this right. You want to hear something on another podcast? Uh, I did a couple weeks ago. I actually told my phone number on the end of it, and the guy said, "Man, you're braver than me." Yeah, that was. <laughs> I I know that was that was Mark's Wired to Hunt podcast. Mark like, Kenyon, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to say a competitive I, that's okay. podcast. We're, yeah, we're uh, there's no rivalry there with us, so. 
um, yeah, I was, I, I thought you were crazy then too, but, uh, but I think it's really cool that you're willing to do that. Well, I like to help hunters, you know, being a successful bow hunter kind of can change your life. It kind of changes how people, other hunters interact with you and, and it kind of changes how you get along with your family during deer season. You know, you're not as stressed out once you get to be kind of consistently successful. And if a year goes by where you don't kill something, it's no big deal, you know, um, you know, you put in your best effort and, you know, if it didn't work, it didn't. The last three years, I've killed two book bucks each year in Michigan. Yeah, I was going to say, are you really qualified to tell us that it's no big deal if you don't shoot anything? I don't know when the last time you uh, didn't fill a tag during a deer uh, season. 2012. <laughs> yeah. 2012, okay. I did not fill any tags. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, okay, then I, I guess you're qualified. That was within the last five years, so. Never even saw a shooter buck in Michigan in 2012. Okay, but what about out of state? Um, those don't count. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I killed one out of state. I always get one out yeah. of state, but those are freebies. Yeah. <laughs> Iowa and Kansas are freebies. It doesn't take a lot of. It doesn't to me, in my opinion, it doesn't take a lot of skill set to kill deer in Iowa and Kansas. That's why all the TV guys go there because it's pretty simple. Yeah. All right. Uh, if they had to hunt a pressured area like Michigan or PA or public land in Wisconsin or Virginia, they they would struggle big time. Yep. I think there's some of those guys that could probably do well no matter where they hunted. And then there's a whole other group that, you know, if they weren't hunting in a high fence, wouldn't know what they're doing. So um, it's hard to lump them all together because I think there's some, some real good hunters out there, but there's also some that are... I just say they, they have a bunch of money so they can they can go hunt wherever they want. Yeah, and that's one thing that's driving me drives me crazy about deer hunting nowadays. Nowadays, you know, back in the old days, you used to progress your skill set, you know, by what you killed. In other words, you know, when I started hunting, I was happy to shoot a fawn or a doe, and then it got to the point where I was shooting year and a half old bucks and then two and a half, so now now it's three and four and a half depending on where I'm hunting. And it's not the case where you progress with your knowledge as you age anymore. Now you can buy or lease a bunch of property and, you know, micromanagement and do some land management and land manipulation. Hell, two or three years, you got half a dozen mature bucks on your property and you can kill one every year, even though your hunting skill set's not very dang good. You've just bought yourself into it. And that's kind of sad to me. You know, we're kind of getting into that European style hunting where only the rich people are going to be able to hunt. And that's, we're far, far away from that, but that's kind of where we're heading. Yeah, I do. I think that's why one of the reasons it's real important that we have a lot of public land. Um, you know, I, I'm not a fan of government control over a lot of things, but I do think one of the gems of this country is that we have public land that everyone can use. Um, and if it, if it's all owned and it's up for the highest bidder, it's, it's going to get rid of, you know, a lot of what we love. Totally agree. Totally agree, Mike. We're very fortunate to live in this country. That's what, that's all I got to say. Yeah, I agree. Very, very fortunate to be born in the USA. Let's get one more thought from Dan before we wrap this thing up. Dan, what would be the harm in trying to do both? Go to the extreme of, of doing all the scent control and just acting like, you know, that wouldn't work and just play in the wind. Have you tried doing that or is it just not worth the trouble? I, I haven't taken it to that extreme personally. I know people who have. I don't think there's a problem with trying it. As a matter of fact, if, so, if somebody's on the fence, I'd suggest they try it. I mean, I would never uh, uh, promote just believing in anything I say or anything John says or anything you say. I think a guy should listen to something and, and have an open mind. But really, uh, the way I learned and the way I hunt was to always be a skeptic of everyone and go out there and learn from the animals. And I think it's good to get ideas in your head from other people and thoughts, but you should still learn it through observation um, because you start finding out uh, a lot of things people uh, take as fact and maybe 95% of the people out there think it is actually false. It's just because one guy with a big mouth kept spreading it and everybody believed it because the way he said it, it made sense. You know, so I, I do think that uh, you should kind of learn for yourself. So I, I think that there is, 
as far as learning, there's no harm in a guy trying it and testing it. Adam, I think that's a perfect place to leave off. I know there's a lot of people who listen to the podcast that feel very strongly one way or another that either they think scent control is going to keep them from being scented at all or they think that scent control is not helpful at all. But I also think there's a lot of people who are in the middle and aren't sure or feel like it helps some. And I think we could all take Dan's advice and maybe come into it with an open mind and find out for ourselves. If if you don't practice any scent control, maybe try you know, going through a complete regimen for a couple hunts. It might be difficult to go with the full scent lock suit, um, but you know what? I bet it's something you probably could try a hunt or two and give it a shot. And then if you're somebody who's hardcore scent control, maybe try a couple hunts. Just don't do anything at all and, and, and see your results. You know, it could be on a example where you're just hunting a field edge and, and looking for does or that kind of thing. I know that's something I'm interested to try myself. What do you think, Adam? You know, both John and Dan are two passionate hunters that are very successful. They've been getting it done for years. They have two different ways of doing things and it works for both of them. So I'm just interested to see where this goes and, you know, how others, other hunters out there take this into practice. For me, I got to figure that out on my own, but I really enjoyed what you said, like about Dan, I think around the 31 minute mark, he was talking about, you know, we're always evolving and always learning as hunters. And if you're not doing that, then, you know, you're just going to kind of become stagnant. So I think as hunters, we just got to continue to bring more information in and test these things in the field. And it's fun. Um, I'm just, I enjoyed listening to both of these gentlemen on this podcast. That's the truth. I'm, I'm real interested to hear what everybody's thoughts are that, that listen to this. Please share with us on social media. And, there, you know, like we talked about earlier, there's some forums out there that have got threads on this. I'm really interested here on, on social media, maybe some Facebook groups and that kind of thing. I think one thing with the forums is they tend to be very one sided because of the group that might be there. Obviously, the hunting beast with, with Dan is, uh, you know, they lean toward Dan's side quite a bit. And Saddle Hunter is, is more John's crowd. Um but I know there's also a thread on archery talk now, and that might be a little more towards the middle. But I'd love to hear some back and forth discussion, maybe not so much arguing, calling these guys out, but just how you think you might apply this yourself. So share share with us on social media where you're posting at, and uh, we'll make sure to take part in that as well. Thanks so much to everyone that's listened and downloaded. This series has been a tremendous success so far. We've had way more downloads than we've had on the other stuff. And, it, and we were excited about where the podcast had gone before that. So thank you so much for listening, especially all the first time listeners. And the next few weeks, we're going to be going back to our regular content, which is talking to biologists and talking about strategies and maybe talk about how we're going to be getting into the rut sometime soon. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when that's going to come out. I'm still sitting here with no power down in Florida. So we'll see how we can get this rolling. Definitely need to spend some time with the family and uh, kind of get back into the groove of things. Um, but thanks so much for, for tuning in. Please subscribe and leave us a review if you get a chance. And until next time, we're out down south.